So the first question, and we're going to start with uh, Dr. Campbell, is speaking from your research experience, et cetera, how would you describe the relationship between racism and unemployment or employment if you are coming from that side of the issue? Before I do that, I'd just like to commend our church, First Unitarian Church, for hosting this activity. And uh, one of the things that we're going to be doing is celebrating our 175th anniversary, and we are having a big, wonderful, fancy gala uh, down at the uh, Cultural Center. And if uh, you have 100 bucks, we wish you to join us. <laughs> <laughs> it will go to a worthy cause, keeping this church in, all, in, in, in action. If I had to give a title to my response, I would call it God's Plan for Employment Salvation, Six Hours Work for Eight Hours Pay. The question that is presented asks for connections. It is a fundamental fact that since the ratification of the Constitution, racism has been connected to employment with the division between free labor, which was predominantly white, and slave labor, which was predominantly black. The so-called three-fifths rule was the racial equation used to make that division. The way in which racism works today within this finance capital system, that is a system where the banks and insurance companies and other large financial institutions control the economy, the way in which work, racism works today is that it must keep large segments of the working class deliberately unemployed, deliberately unemployed in order to keep down inflation. Inflation for the finance capitalists or the banksters, as some people call them, <laughs> is the greatest fear in the hierarchical people at the top. See Mr. Bernanke's report today. And the best way to do that within the present imperialist system is to use racism, because racism is the historic default position for controlling economic life in this country. Or more precisely, neo-racism. This is a term which I developed to refer to the way in which African-American elites now help to keep that racism more acceptable, particularly since today we see the intersection of class and race based upon uh, looking down upon the lower class black folks, particularly black youth and young adults. Here are some examples of this racism working with unemployment. We eliminated, we didn't do it, they eliminated affirmative action and the person leading the charge was an African-American, Glenn Lowry. They have eliminated race-specific quotas on the job. So as you walk down the street and see all this uh, repairs going on, count the number of black folks you see taking those jobs. And by pitting blacks against Latinos, they hope to keep that divide and conquer process still going. They still have the last hired, first fired mechanism but it's shaped by a kind of seniority bias, which itself grew out of a good struggle on the part of the unions, but which eventually turned into racism because some of these unions kept black folks and Latino folks out for full-time participation. So if we were to say in any nutshell, if we're going to solve the question of unemployment and connect it to racism, we must recognize that fact that racism is needed today to maintain this unemployment situation because if everybody had a job, this system based upon controlling money supply would be in deep trouble. Inflation is created, they say, by people having too much money in their pockets and spending it. So imagine if everybody had a job and was spending that money. So clearly we need to figure out a way as we move down this historic path to get past this idea that in order to protect the value of the gold and the silver and the dollar bills and the rubles and the yen and the euros, people must be forced into situations like this, like this, like this. The homelessness is simply folks without a job. That's all it is, people without work, can't pay the rent, end up on the streets as if it was a separate problem from this reality that we have described. 
And so to me, there's this historic connection going back to the days of slavery uh, between racism and employment and unemployment. Um, yeah, sure. <laughs> um, I come at the uh, question of uh, racism in general and racist unemployment um, from the perspective of my uh, clinical work, ca taking care of newborn babies, uh, and also as an epidemiologist, a study of the pattern of disease in the population. Um, a striking feature of uh, health in the age group that I deal with, that is infants, is that the likelihood of a baby dying in the first year of life in this country is two and a half times as high uh, if that baby is African American than if uh, he or she is white. That's one of the two most striking features. The other striking feature, by the way, is that everybody in this country is at greater risk. Infants born to white parents in the United States, if they were ranked as a separate country, would still rank 25th in the world for infant mortality. The whole country is 29th. So it, it doesn't help you that much uh, to be white. So there's a systemic problem affecting the entire population. Um, as mentioned in the introduction, um, about my work that I've done with Jim Collins over the last several years, we started out in the same perspective or that everyone else except we were skeptical when they said there was something about the black race that caused bad health outcomes. It didn't really make sense to us that that should be the case biologically. And it turns out that, in fact, you can find um, black infants who are born in Illinois who weigh the same amount as white infants. It turns out they're uh, infants born to women who've immigrated here from West Africa. So if there was a low birth weight gene and it came from Africa, well, they would have more of it than African Americans. Um, so that kind of dismissed the genetic theory, uh, the biological concept of race from the whole study of what we're doing. And as we turned our attention to social construct uh, of race, which could be said more succinctly by just using the word racism, racial discrimination, um, we find that just about every aspect that we look at uh, is predictive of bad health outcomes. Not just infant mortality, but high blood pressure, heart disease, cancer, diabetes, et cetera. The list goes on. What are the manifestations? Well, in broad categories, we could start with historical, as Dr. Campbell pointed out. Um, going back to the legacy of slavery, um, moving into institutional, those structures which exist in our society, which treat people uh, unequally, um, the distribution of the population in a living space. Chicago is the most segregated city in the United States, decade after decade, when the University of Chicago demographers check it again. Um, this has a major impact on health outcomes, and probably this is all mediated through social and economic uh, mechanisms. And finally, the last one on the list, which I would refer to as interpersonal racism, is probably, in, in some ways, um, the least uh, powerful uh, in some cases, but it's the one that we think of first when the word racism is used. Um, this would be the personal discrimination of one person against another. It is that last one, however, that is the cutting edge, I think, of racist unemployment. Um, I'll just mention one piece of research that was done by somebody else, uh, uh, I think really speaks to this more clearly than anything. Um, a researcher from Northwestern did a study in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, uh, about eight years ago, you may have heard of. Um, in this study, they had um, white and African-American uh, actors, basically, present themselves uh, for job interviews and make applications at a, a series of uh, entry-level jobs. Um, they had identical resumes, um, and they presented themselves in a very um, professional manner. Um, half of the time, they would have on their resume a prior 
uh, conviction for drug uh, possession. The others were uh, clean resume, just, uh, just their education and so forth. Interestingly, um, for both groups, white and black, it was a disadvantage to have been convicted for drug possession. Okay, not a big surprise. What was a little shocking was that if you were um, an applicant with an absolutely clean record who'd never had any trouble with the law and you were black, you had less chance of being called for a job interview than if you were white and had been convicted of drug possession. Um, this says to me that it's not a level playing field out there. And uh, the, it's not that no one who's black can get a job, obviously, uh, or that anyone who is not black is going to get a job, obviously. However, the deck is stacked. And this is just one specific example of uh, the types of stressors that exist in people's lives. And these impact on a variety of health outcomes, including childbearing. Okay. Okay. Walter, you want to go next? Thank you. Um, just to chime in, and I'm definitely in agreement with the panel. To give you a, a background of my perspective, um, I come from a research and ground level perspective. I'm uh, in the field every day working with job seekers who are looking for jobs. I work with ex-offenders, formerly homeless individuals. Um, but not only that, I've done research in the academy that uh, backs up the notion that racism does exist in our society today. Um, not only racial discrimination, age discrimination, gender discrimination, they're, they're still prevalent in today's workforce. And as uh, W.E.B. Du Bois stated in 1903, the problem of the 20th century is the problem of the color line. Well, that's still true today. Uh, race and racial discrimination exists very much so in employment. Um, especially in today's climate, when you have so much unemployment, people are out here fighting for resources. And as I said, working with um, the groups of people I work with on a daily basis. Um, it's very hard for blacks and Latinos and other minorities to succeed in the workforce, as the panel said, when you have a deck stacked against you. Um, and just piggybacking on what the gentleman here said, there's another piece of research that I became acquainted with when I was in grad school working on my master's degree. And it was actually a study completed by uh, Professor Deva Pager and Bruce Western from uh, Princeton University. And it was based on discrimination in low wage labor markets. It was completed in 2005. Um, and what the research showed was that white job seekers fresh out of prison had a better chance of gaining employment than blacks with no criminal record. Um, the research was done, as I said, in New York City um, at about 1,500 private employers. Um, the research went on to show uh, that a criminal record re reduced positive responses from employers by about 35% for white applicants and 57% for black applicants. Even without criminal records, black applicants had low rates of positive responses, about the same as the response rate for white applicants with criminal records. This, the bright spot in this study, I, I guess, it showed that uh, minority employers were more accepting of minority applicants um, and job applicants with pr prison records. Um, the basis of the study actually showed how young men who applied for real job openings throughout the city presented the same qualifications and experience, whether black or white. Uh, and to just go on with the whole notion of unemployment in the communities that I actually work in, which is Grand Boulevard, Douglas, Bronzeville, um, according to the U.S. Census, unemployment was 25% in 2000. 
and when the norm for America, you know, if we're at 11% and that's devastating, these communities have been facing 25% for years. But now, in, in this economic catastrophe we're in now, we're looking at unemployment rates for blacks and Latinos at 50 to 60%. So I would say that's a, a, a state of emergency, if anything. That's right. All right. You guys both want to answer this? Or you um, uh, racism in relation to employment um, or, or unemployment or employment, um, it's a very tricky thing. Uh, I was a, a manager for the Chicago Transit Authority for about seven years, and when I started with the company, uh, I didn't have a college degree, I didn't have any management training, and I actually started washing cars there. Mm -hmm. um, and I was pulled in because I knew somebody who knew somebody, and what the boss told me was, hey, you know what, where did you do before? I said, I worked for a bank. He says, well, you're about to make more money than you ever made in your entire life. <laughs> now, at that point in time, I was already making $15 an hour washing cars and doing whatever jobs they told me to do, but I had no clue what was planned for me uh, based on the fact that I had a family member who worked there in a higher position. Um, the family member wasn't directly in, in my department, but I started being groomed. Uh, I was groomed to learn the administrative uh, part. I became uh, my general manager's right-hand guy. I was his administrative manager, dealing with FMLA, dealing with uh, disciplinary action, all this stuff that I was kind of just thrust into and I was grateful for the opportunity. But as I got more engulfed in this opportunity, I started to see the grander picture, mm -hmm. okay? There was a white manager, there was a Mexican manager, there was a black manager, and there was an Asian manager. So, and what I saw there was there was still racism and discrimination, but it was strategically put in place mm -hmm. to protect the overall company. Now, don't get me wrong, I mean, there, my, my vice president's uh, senior vice president was an African American, but it doesn't matter what rank you hold, it matters who your connections are and who's gonna tell who what to do. I hear so many people criticize the President of the United States of America, and they don't realize he is not the complete and ultimate power that be. Mm -hmm. You know, there was a, 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 I'm sorry, a documentary on, on the uh, History Channel today talking about how the President stepped into the first day. They don't even know what they're doing. <laughs> they have a bunch of people telling them what they need to do. So in that point, um, I believe that it's, you know, the undertones of discrimination are there, the racism's there, but it's, you know, strategically handled everything from promotion to, to, to uh, discipline. Since I started my own business and I found the opportunity that I found, what I found was uh, in, the, in the company that I worked for, I had, I had the ability to hire and work with people that I decided to work with based on their character, not necessarily what they look like, or what their family background was, or what neighborhood they came from. The only three things they asked me when I interviewed with this company was, are you a good person, are you willing to work, and are you willing to learn? Mm -hmm. And since I started with this company, I've seen nothing but examples of people who were from different walks of life, different backgrounds, and they become successful, not necessarily based because the company made them successful, but because them as the individual made the decision and did the things and put themselves in place to do that. So, you know, it, you know, you can look at it twofold, and yes, there, it's out there, it's alive and well, but on the other hand, us as individuals have the ability to go after what we want and, and make things happen for ourselves. Okay. All right, we're going to go on to the next question. Has this relationship changed over time? Uh, if so, how? And I'm going to start with, uh, with Walter this time. I do think the relationship has changed. Um, in terms of racism, no longer do we have signs on the door that say for colors only or uh, blacks or Jews shouldn't apply and women shouldn't apply for, for positions. But um, from my research and from other research has shown that there's a new form of social control and it's the expansion of our uh, prison system. In 1970, there were about 300,000 Americans incarcerated. Mm. In, in 2011, we had 2.5 million um, Americans incarcerated in prisons, jails, or on probation, parole. 
Um, so in the context of that, because there is a strong relationship between African American, especially African American and Latino males being at car incarcerated at extremely dangerous rates, that is a precursor or a context for discrimination. Because if you come home from prison with the mark or the X of a, a felony on your back, it's hard for, for uh, those individuals to find employment. Um, and there's a, a very good book that I employ everybody to read. It's by uh, Professor Mc, uh, Michelle Alexandra, Alexander, I'm sorry. It's called The New Jim Crow. Mm -hmm. And it really looks at the, the issue from a perspective that, you know, it, it's so perme permeated throughout our institutions. I'm talking about going all the way up to the Supreme Court where time and time of, again, the, the Supreme Court initiates and, and says that uh, employers, uh, criminal justice authorities, and different agencies can discriminate against uh, minorities. They don't come out explicitly and state it, right. but it's so entrenched in the policies in the United States that it's hard to even dismantle it on the ground level where I'm working every day. So um, yes, African Americans and Latinos and other minorities have made a lot of strides in the last 50 years, but the playing field is still not level. The playing field is still not equitable. Um, I just wanted to share one other point on that. A study that just came out that was conducted by the EOC on discrimination of workers. Um, what it showed was that uh, people who were unemployed because of, of the recession showed that white workers were at a 7.9% um, unemployment peak compared to 165 for blacks, the first fire syndrome. The research also showed that black women were unemployed 8.5 weeks longer than white males. Also, 7.9% uh, was the unemployment peak for black workers with a bachelor's degree, and that was two times higher um, than their white counterparts. So the research is there. It shows us that um, Strides have been made, but the fight is a totally different fight. It's not overt and it's explicit. It's, it's more covert and entrenched in policy and practices that many times in corporate America have been grandfathered in the policy um, that you can't readily see on the, on the uh, surface. You can go ahead and have a seat anywhere. She's going to stand over there. Right. Uh, your turn. Well, let me just pick up the, the same theme, because I, I was thinking along the same lines. Um, having, having grown up uh, during the period of uh, legal apartheid in the South in Jacksonville, Florida, um, I, I experienced that version of racial discrimination uh, as a child. Um, and I suppose I had some illusions about it being different when I moved north. Uh, my mother, who was from from the north, had raised me with certain illusions, so all, all well-intentioned, I'm sure. But uh, what we see here is a different version of the same thing. Um, whereas it was um, the you know the law was if you were white, you went to one school, and if you were black, you went to another school in in Jacksonville in the 1950s and 60s. Um, including 12 years after Brown versus Board of Education. Thank you very much. Um, but here, it's neighborhood schools. So by having racial segregation of housing, the same thing results, complete segregation for most of the students in the Chicago school system. Um, there was a, uh, an interesting comment made by 
uh, a young woman who was working in our uh, research group a few years ago. She was a grad student in uh, School of Public Health and helping uh, uh, Dr. Collins and myself do an analysis of uh, interview data. We had done a study where we were looking specifically at interpersonal racism in that, in that particular study, and we interviewed um, two groups of African American women. Uh, those who had given birth to full-term seven-pound babies and those who had given birth to premature three-pound or smaller babies to see what the differences had been in their experience during pregnancy or in their life in general. And the um, most powerful uh, difference that came out was their perception, at any rate, of racial discrimination in a variety of different settings getting a job, at school, in public places, et cetera. Um, interestingly, and this was a little bit, I was a, a little surprised at this myself because uh, um, more than half of our sample was from Cook County Hospital. Um, most of the women uh, had been employed during their pregnancy. Uh, and one of the strongest uh, uh, of these various questions had to do with race, racism on the job and finding a job. Um, there was one section where specific um, discriminatory experiences were queried um, uh, for these women. And um, nine of the 10 in the, in the list were statistically significant in terms of predicting uh, a premature baby. Um, they, those were such things as, um, I'm often assumed to work in a lower job category than I do, or um, you know, things of that type. But the one that didn't come out was, people tell racist jokes <laughs> in my presence. And the young woman who was helping us with a data analysis, um, I said, isn't that interesting? Uh, it, she happened to be African American. Uh, I said, uh, what do you make of that? And she said, oh yeah, it's more subtle now. They don't tell the jokes anymore. <laughs> uh, so yes, I think things have changed over the last generation. Uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, these changes have taken place, uh, and they have taken place in historical periods. Uh, during the uh, worst periods of uh, Jim Crow, uh, when you had two major wars, World War I and World War II, there was a need for a fully active workforce. And you saw racist unemployment diminish, being transformed into racist job classifications. You had a job but it was a race-defined job. Certain kind of jobs were for whites and certain kinds of for blacks, but the point was you had a job and you could make a decent living during these wartime uh, situations. And this is, like I said, during the period of Jim Crow. Steel mills, meat factories, automobile industries and things of that nature absorbed as much work as they could straight off the farm, as we used to say, in order to fill in what was called manpower shortages. And by manpower shortages, it meant putting women in there also as well. And many a black woman, for example, from Alabama, Mississippi, and Arkansas, found themselves on the assembly line, learning how to put a car together piece by piece. And during the period of post-war resurgence, or called post-war resurgent industrialization, that is, the United States was one of the few countries left outside of the Soviet Union, well, even the Soviet Union suffered greatly, uh, had full industrial capacity and a world market needing to be reindustrialized. During that period, 1945, 1985, race-defined jobs lessened, though were not totally eliminated, but wages were fixed to the cost of living and adjusted accordingly. So even black workers with black jobs could still have a living wage, allowing them to enter the upper levels of the working class, the so-called middle class. And then with affirmative action, formerly jobs, a formerly jobs for whites only, were now open to all well-prepared black people and other people of color. That was 1965 to 1983. But with the deindustrialization deindustrialization created by finance capital linked to the intensification of imperialism, 1980 to the present, something we call Reaganomics. That's what it was called. That, that was that period when it began to shift Reaganomics. <laughs> Suddenly, job elimination 
and downsizing, downsizing were brought in, and again with a racist character. But this time in a new form, neo-racism. Whereas my brother mentioned over here, where your boss or manager could be a person of color carrying out the policy. And so there have been these changes, but now we're on the down curve of the situation. And those new changes that are about to hit us will definitely create a rage of storm. Carter, do you have any particular questions? Um, <laughs> uh, yeah. go okay, um, I come from a, a little bit of a different perspective. As I was going through college and finishing up my degree, I found this company that I currently run and operate and own. And so as far as, as going into corporate and, and uh, dealing with things like what Sam was talking about, in my initial jobs, like going through school, I, um, I did deal with racism, double whammy, being uh, <laughs> a female and a Hispanic. Um, and I did not make as much money as my white male counterparts. Um, but it was, you know, it, at that time it was like, well, this is not what I'm going, going to do, so it doesn't really matter. I'm going to school, I'm getting my degree, it's, it's, it's going to be fine. Well, when I, uh, when I started with this company, um, I, and over the 10 year period that I've been with them, what I've seen as far as change in, um, in, in, in people's mindsets, I believe, um, interviewing them and hiring them to be independent contractors, uh, it went from, you know what, my job is going to take care of me, um, they won't lay me off, that, you know, I'm going to be fine, they're going to take care of me for the rest of my life, right. to, you know, I don't need anything extra, to where we are today, and sitting down with, you know, the same people with the same, from the same industries, saying that, hey, you know what, my mind is open now, I need to look for something that, um, that I can control myself so that I don't have to be in this position again of, of dealing with um, sort of you know, competing for a job or begging for a job, trying to keep my job, worried about um, is somebody younger going to come in and work my job for half the salary uh, with half the experience and then I'm out. You know, at this time, I believe that uh, they are looking for a way to make a change and owning your own business and running your own business is the only way that you can control your future. And I think that a lot of people now are uh, changing to that mindset of I need to do something different, which is what I believe all of us are trying to come to a, to a conclusion of, of how do we change this. And I believe that that is, that is the way. And, that, and the people's mindsets right now are changing to that, you know, how can I control myself? How can I control my future and not have it in the hands of somebody else? Um, yeah, I believe that it's changed, like uh, George said, right, George? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, you know, you don't have the, the blacks only or whites only on the, you know, water fountains, but, you know, it's been, it's been uh, hidden through, and I was very educated today um, because when you said that there's no more quotas or they got away with affirmative action, I wasn't aware of that. And I know that a big part, portion of me being hired into where I was before was having to do with that. Um, but you know, you know, you got the EEOC, and you know, and the policies that just kind of cover over everything. It's kind of like uh, you know, the people who are losing their houses right now—they didn't read the document, <laughs> and they know that most people won't read the document to find out what their rights are. So they hide them within those policies, and that's—I mean, it's, it's alive and it's well. And you right. know, I, whether it's from a, a, a organizational standpoint or from an individual standpoint, you know, you still have the racial jokes. You still have the people who just overlook it, um, and and it, it, there needs to be awareness about it in order to change it to you know, because you. Can't can't change everybody's behavior, but you can change your individual behavior, which will then you know, impose upon others to, to maybe move and act in the same, right. same uh, direction. Amen. Good. All right, the next question, now we're, uh, the answers have already started to go into what can we do about this, but these are going to focus a little bit more on that. So the next question is, what is the biggest barrier standing in the way of solving the issue? And you can provide a brief explanation if you would like. Well, to shock everybody, <laughs> the federal government is the biggest barrier since its anti-inflation, anti-deficit ideology linked to its pro-corporate tax orientation now shapes policy. 
Even my entrepreneurial brothers and sisters can tell you sometimes, just get a nice loan to get you past a certain crisis so you can buy a new something or another. I have a little business of my own, Pegasus Educational Service Incorporated. I'd love to have a DVD copier. <laughs> <laughs> I had to borrow money from my wife to get it. <laughs> <laughs> and the specific forces within the government which controls the levels of unemployment are two. One which is uh, clearly in the government and one which sounds like it's in the government, but it's not. The Supreme Court, which outlawed all policies, all laws which had an anti-racist employment dimension. They will tell you hey, all the black women got laid off. Well, so long as the guy doesn't hate black women, then that was not racist. That was not sexist. So therefore, yeah, you can do that. The whole con the shift, instead of examining the institutional nature in which racism operates to hurt black, Latino, and whites, by the way, they look at some kind of personal intentionality rather than inbred, as you pull it out, policy, institutionality. And so it acts that even with President Obama, and I'll give him some props, if he, no matter if he wanted to change every one of these things, as it was said, he went in there as a junior baseball player coming to a big game first day and to get ready to throw him some balls. That's why he should have ran for vice president, but that's another story. <laughs> he should have, I'm a Clintonian leftover. <laughs> the second power is the Federal Reserve System, which despite its name is not officially a part of the federal government, even though it oversees the economic policies of the federal government. They, turn the, they try to turn on these switches, on and off, up with the rates, down with the rates, and it sounds good, or oh, they're cutting the rates, but you will not hardly see those rates cut when you look at your credit card. Sometimes when they try to suck you, I mean, excuse me, one time they entice you into getting that credit card, they'll give you these zero APRs for a year. And then you forgot it was a year because you forgot what month you got it. The next thing you know, you're here with a 9.9% .9 on a $20 charge. Where the hell that come from? <laughs> so that Federal Reserve structure and that government, which is the present time, it wasn't always like this because when workers were organized and fighting back, they were forced to give us concessions. When black and Latinos were fighting back with La Raza on the one side and uh, Martin Luther King on the other, Chavez on one side and Malcolm X on the other, they were forced to give us these concessions. But we got complacent. We thought they did it because they loved us and liked us. In fact, they were scared of us. Until that fear comes back, these two forces, the federal government in and of itself with all of its complexity and the Federal Reserve System with all of its uh, control, it's almost like a great octopus controlling every dollar penny we have. That's why everybody should get a dollar out tonight and take a look at it. It says their Federal Reserve note. Not backed by nothing, <laughs> but the faith and credit of the Chinese government. <laughs> so that's my vision of the barriers. Okay, uh, you guys want to um, uh, Yeah, the biggest, uh, the biggest barrier I believe standing in the way is ignorance. Um, ignorance and people being unaware of their own behavior and subconscious thoughts. Um, racism is taught and unfortunately, um, you know, the only behavior we can control is our own. Uh, you know, we got to work on ourselves first. Uh, I read a book once that said you can't change things from the outside in, it has to be from the inside out. And until you as an individual start being able to do that, you'll be able to start, you know, inspiring others to do the same. Um, but you can't con control the behaviors of others and we must become leaders and lead by example and raise awareness. Promote change within our own individual networks. Uh, in the United States of America, we all have an opportunity to achieve whatever it is that we want. And at the end of the day, the only thing that stands in the way of your goals and dreams is you. I really love the fact of, of you know, we have to fight the fear. You know, we've been, you know, as middle income, middle class people, we've been bred to live in fear. I'm a fear I'm going to lose my job. I'm a fear I don't have enough money to send my kids to college. A fear of I'm not going to be, you know, one of those big important people that speak in, on TV and stuff like that. Um, and, and I believe that the revolution that needs to take place is not a revolution with guns and, and, and killing in the streets like they are in the countries across the, you know, across the globe. I believe the, the revolution that has to take change is, is, is the education part, the education piece, these inner city um, you know, neighborhoods that don't have somebody teaching them about finance, that don't have somebody teaching them about goals, about being a leader, about taking steps and actions that together, united, you, you cannot beat that force. 
You know, the government knows everything because they write the policies. Well, guess what? We need to start studying those policies and understanding them, and we need to communicate them to the people who may not be on our level and be able to give it to them so they can take advantage of everything that this country has to offer. I believe we are in a, you know, a pretty tragic state right now, but at the same time, we have the ability as individuals to control who we are, where we are, and what we want to be in the future. Um, I agree with the panel that it is a very uh, systematic and systemic problem. Um, and again, we have to look at the top and work from the bottom at the same time. You have to look at the Supreme Court. We have to look at all our institutions, uh, systems in the United States. We have to look at education reform. We also have to look at state, federal, and local um, hiring policies. So when we hold our, our own state, local, and federal hiring bodies, whether, whatever those agencies are, they should set the mark for corporate America. Um, and there has been a lot of, a lot of work around that, um, especially when it comes to ex-offenders on the municipal level and the whole ban the box, um, the whole ban the box um, initiative. And for those who don't know, um, that's basically an initiative and uh, advocacy to take the whole question off of um, applications, have you ever been convicted of a crime? Because um, I just have to go back to the whole notion of the social control piece and Crimin criminality and how that um, prevents minorities from gaining employment. Um, also, once you take the, that question off of the box, uh, the ban the box off of the application, it actually gives um, applicants a better chance of not having their employment application discarded. So it gives them a fair shake to get an interview to actually talk to employers, explain their situation. Um, you know, they may have gone through uh, some type of eco economic um, situation in their life where they had to commit crime. The whole strain theory of um, why communities are in battle with crime is because, well, we're trying to adhere to, you know, a certain type of Americanism that says, well, you need this, you need this, you mm -hmm. need this. And if you can't buy it, what happens? People commit crime. Um, at the same time, as individuals, we have to be less consumers and more producers. You know, we don't have to go to, to Walmart all, all the time or Jewel um, to purchase our food. We can grow our own food, create our own products. And it goes back um, to what the the gentleman at the end of the panel was saying about building your own enterprises and not always having to rely on an employer to make decisions for you when you can start your own business and make decisions that are more equitable for everyone. Dr. David? Um, well, it's been a lot of uh, very well thought out ideas here, so I'm going to uh, throw out something which may not be as well thought out, but it's a, um, a theoretical construct that makes sense to me. Um, I, I would refer to this as the, um, the political economy of racism. Um, this uh, came up with, um, influenced by other things I've read, I can't even remember where, but trying to figure out why it is that over decade after decade after decade, ideas such as this biological idea about what race is, um, you know, inferiority of, of certain racial groups, et cetera. These ideas are disproven repeatedly, repeatedly, and yet they keep coming back. It's like, you know, the vampire. You, you keep driving the stake through its heart and the thing keeps popping back up. So why is that? Um, and to me, it seems like there has to be some very, you know, fundamental force at work here. Um, and actually, an interesting calculation, uh, I think, gives some insight into this. I just got the you know, uh, numbers from government websites 
what is the total number of um, African Americans of working age between, say, 20 and 65, um, and uh, uh, look at the um, mean income of African Americans compared to whites um, controlling for educational attainment, and that comes out to about 65 cents on a dollar. And you multiply that by the, you know, several tens of millions of uh, individuals, uh, African Americans of working age, and it comes out with about $165 billion per year of savings in wages mm -hmm. uh, for the uh, employer class. Now, um, not that they necessarily do this calculation uh, before they, you know, plan their budget for the year, but <laughs> someplace in business school they must have gotten the idea that this, <laughs> this is helpful. And when you then draw the connection between who are the, the owners of uh, the large businesses, the large employers, and what connections might they have with the ideas that form our culture. Who sits on the board of regents of the universities? Who owns the newspapers and controls the uh, deciding you know, stock votes in major media uh, enterprises, et cetera, et cetera? So it's no wonder uh, that this um, beast keeps coming back to life because it's a very profitable set of ideas in terms of being able to extract money uh, from the working population. So the answer to the question is, uh, what is the main obstacle? I think it's the market system, capitalism itself. All right, so our last question before we conclude and before we open it up to questions from you guys uh, is, and we, we've, everybody's touched on it a little bit of what can we do, and especially with this last question of asking about the barriers, uh, but this is directly focused on what can we do about it, and we being anyone not just someone who's in charge of hiring or someone who is a social activist or anything like that, but how can anyone have an impact in this, this issue? Uh, we will start down over here, with, uh, Walter. Okay, um, first I would say um, for those who aren't activists who, or who aren't involved in some type of activism, attach yourself to some type of campaign or activism that is fighting for change, such as the one I mentioned with the whole ban the box from uh, employment applications. Or work, you know, you can go out and find not-for-profit organizations or other organizations that fight against these policies um, or economic structures that actually prevent employment for uh, minorities. Um, the second piece is to educate yourself on the policies um, of what's really going on with the Supreme Court and uh, as the panel said with, with um, the EEOC and, and how the economy really works. Um, also, it starts at home. So the education piece, you know, with, with your children, your neighbors, it's really about building communities from, from a village perspective. So if, if more people on the ground level actually connect together and start a mass movement, you know, if we boycott corporate America, they'll respond. I mean, the, the whole notion of gas being almost $5 a gallon if we were all not to go to a gas station for one day, I really think BP would respond. I mean, I know that's not a, a whole system change, but at least it's a start. Um, also, I have to go back to what I said earlier about being uh, more of a producer and not a consumer. So thinking about starting your own enterprise whether it's a for-profit enterprise or a social enterprise where you actually control your hiring policies to make them more equitable, more socially responsible. Um, the last piece is, of course, the education piece. Um, as a nation, we've f fallen so far behind in terms of the global perspective of education and training. Um, we just have to get back to where we need to be. 
and be more progressive. I'm gonna work my way down this way this time. Um, yeah, I definitely agree. Uh, education is a huge component, and uh, formal education is 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 great. Um, but more self-education along with that formal education is going to open up more uh, doorways, I believe. Um, you can't change the system, or you can, but you have to, uh, I, it, just like uh, doctor said down there, that it's, it's like a vampire coming back, you can't kill it, right? So if, if, if it's a, a huge problem, we as individuals have to do something um, about it to change, and education is the key um, to making that happen and becoming aware uh, because we're always taught and I think it, it again it's changing that mindset we're always taught you know growing up what are we taught you go to school you study hard you go to college study hard you get a job and you work hard and you retire and the company is going to take care of you well we all know that that is gone with the wind I mean that's never coming back and so what do we have to do to change that? Um, just like Walter said, I believe that taking control of yourself and figuring out through your education, how can I make myself marketable? And because we are in a, a capitalistic society, um, take advantage of that capitalism. People come here every day for the freedoms that we sometimes take advantage of. You know, they come here specifically to open their own businesses and they are successful at it. But because we were taught, you know, maybe as middle income uh, people, middle income families, that we have to do certain things in a certain way to keep with the structure of um, society to be socially accepted, we have to do, you know, go to school, get a job and, and do those certain things. We have to start thinking outside of the box a little bit and start thinking about how can we help ourselves instead of somebody else helping us. And so, do you have anything to answer? Okay. <laughs> well, I guess maybe my, uh, my role is going to become the criti critic of capitalism. Uh, <laughs> that, that relates to my job uh, in healthcare. Um, Everybody knows that the United States is the only industrialized country that doesn't have universal health care. Um, and even with the um, health reform package that was eventually passed and will limp into some kind of, you know, effect over the next few years, we still are the only industrialized country without universal health care. Um, you know, I chose to work in the county hospital system because I really didn't like when I was, the eight years I was over at, at Children's. Nice place, great folks, really skillful, but I really didn't like how we were more and more being put in a position of doing the wallet biopsy before admission. You have to know what sort of insurance people have before you can serve them. Um, and at, at the county, that's not been the way it, it's run, although that too is changing under new corporate management. Um, people sometimes ask me, you know, well, gosh, you know, uh, you know, doctors aren't aren't you supposed to like want to have your own practice so you you can make a you know a few extra hundred thousand dollars per year or whatever? <laughs> and um, you know, um, I don't really find that so important. I is in the ability to take care of people who need to be taken care of, and Lord knows we live comfortably uh, on the kind of salaries that they give doctors in the public sector. Um, uh, it's perfectly, um, you know, clear to me that it's a superior system to just be able to give according to what is needed um, rather than according to what people's ability to pay is. And so then the next question is, well, so you're like for socialized medicine? I guess so. You know, if that's what you if that's what you call it, okay. Uh, I mean, um, and so uh, when pressed on that, I, my only real objection is that that's the only thing that's socialized. You know, why can't people have housing? Hey, wouldn't transportation for everybody be a, a nice thing? Education, public education is disappearing rapidly before our eyes. Um, 
So basically, a lot of things that were put into place over the last, you know, 50, 100 or more years um, seem to be evaporating under the um, current, you know, ideological uh, dominance of the sort of market, free market uh, furor. Um, to me, doesn't really make uh, sense in terms of the vast majority. And makes it look if you if you are a business owner, and I don't mean necessarily a small business, but if you're a big business owner, it makes a lot of sense. Um, but for the other 90 something percent of the population, it's really not necessarily that helpful. Certainly not if you get sick. So. Can I? No. Uh, no. Yes. Go first, and then you can say something. <laughs> First thing, uh, the idea of internal inner education, that strikes me in knowing who and really what you are. So the first step that the ordinary person can do is to recognize that you must begin to treat the right to work for every willing hand is an inalienable right, fundamental. God demanded it. You got to sweat by the Sweat of your bow and briars and all that kind of bad stuff, but that's how you work out your salvation. You got to have a job. <laughs> well, what does that mean? It means that without work for wages in this capitalist system, we cannot buy the products of our business friends up here. Otherwise, if everybody's an entrepreneur producing something, nobody's buying, there we are. So somebody's got to be the buyer. So we need, so I'm looking to the buying people. Without them, there is no society. And yet they act like they don't believe it, the powers that rule us, because if you have workers someplace else you can exploit, then why not? We must recognize that the right to have a job, work for wages in this capitalist system, you can have neither life, nor liberty, nor way to pursue happiness. Not about loving money or, or, or wanting it, out of some obsessive desire like these rich folks have. It is a need that has been created by a structure, and when that structure one day will disappear, as God has ordained, it will disappear or be overthrown or destroyed, especially if it can't supply jobs to people. That's, a, that's just, you will be mocked. You can't play with God and his power. He will destroy systems where people cannot get to work, to live, to eat, to have children that are healthy. He will not, or she will not, for my sisters here, she will not allow such systems to continue because they are demonic. Secondly, we must wed our white brothers and sisters. Prop number two, here's a white man. <laughs> There's a white brother, look what happened to him. <laughs> he had faith in the system. He believed that he would be privileged always. He forgot the theory of the Civil War, that if you get in the way of powers greater than you, even though we thought you were the king of the hill with all your slaves and all your control of the government, by 1865, they had been shot to hell because these privileges come and go with whoever has the most power. Therefore, we must win this brother and sister to recognize that these privileges they gave you was designed to blind you to your working class reality. You were the beneficiaries, they told us, and made us hate you and look at you with anger and outrage. Male, genitalized, and all that other stuff. But now we recognize that we're all working class folks. And in order for a fight for jobs to take place, white brothers and sisters must take part, including leading the fight against racist unemployment. Because the consciousness that comes with that, talk about internal revolution, there will be a revolution inside of a white person to say, hey, I can't be liberated until my, that Latino youth and that black youth down there who can't get a job because he stole some candy when he was 12 <laughs> is free to reach out and be a part of the system in the consumer section of the process. We must recognize that deliberately keeping Latin and black youth and young adults unemployed to hold down inflation as well as the way to which the system is operating, as well as other workers of color, drags down life for all. Every time you put a black person or a Latino person or a poor white person in jail, that's X thousands of dollars that could go to job creation, building something, cleaning up these houses, sticking some, some tar on these potholes that are all over the place. <laughs> now, here's the key part. It's for average folks in this room. 
we must build a specific structure for this fight. And it's called the Unemployment Council. The Unemployment Councils will be the nucleus of the SNCC, the SCLC, NAACP of the coming struggle. Once we grasp that our right to a job is an inalienable right, I didn't mess up your investment portfolio and tell you got to fire me to keep your $7 million bonus, Mr. whoever those guys are. That's my right to have this job. And so we will prepare a new strategy called the work in. You've heard of the sit in, the swim in. What is a work in? Unemployed people get all dressed up and neat and go and go to work. Go to that bank, go to that, I'm here to work, I'm here to work, I have to start doing something. <laughs> Grocery store, I'm sorry, I'm having bagging bag in the grocery Wait, what are you doing in here? I'm working. <laughs> but that comes with discipline and training, because this is a school for a bigger struggle. It is a school to empower you to understand that you are the foundation of this society and not that glitterati that they want you to admire on television because some woman and man get married and everybody in the working class in England with their mouths hanging up except for those who understand the game. Oh my God, William's getting married. <laughs> William getting married. <laughs> William getting married. <laughs> form of idolatry that God just shakes her head at and says, what the hell did I create? But that's all right. <laughs> but that is all right. Once we grasp that we're going to develop these unemployment councils, that all the tools that have been developed over 2,000 years of human struggle will be brought to bear. And what we'll be calling for, that's very logical, six hours work for eight hours pay. You don't have to fire anybody. Work six hours, and you free up an entire section of work. And yet you're paying them at the same eight hour rate so they can buy all the stuff that my producer's going to produce here. It's, it's very logical, it is very reasonable. And at the same time, we want to be a living wage, a living wage as the minimum wage. This begins with educating ourselves to the need for multiracial unity, international solidarity, multicultural appreciation, so we are more united than driven apart. My good friend here asked, why is it that the vampires keep coming back? Because the vampires got sexy. <laughs> Haven't you seen Twilight? <laughs> Everybody want to have sexual relations with a vampire. <laughs> so sexy crap like racial identityism and white privilege-ism and any kind of thing to keep us divided-ism and they make us look slick by having Whoopi Goldberg type people front it. The vampire has gotten sexy. It looks so cuddly and cute, so cuddly and cute as we think, well, I got racial identity. I'm not a worker, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a ten American. And when we break through that narrowed reality and recognize we're just workers trying to buy and and where possible, own a little business, whatever we want to do, then we will have to have some mass education to recognize this fact that racist unemployment hurts all workers regardless of color. Just like slavery was hurting those poor white brothers and sisters who fought for the South during this war of the rebellion. And once they wake up to that reality, that work is a part of who we are and what we must do, then you will not just walk away from a job. Oh, they laid me off. You'll be angry, not at me or her or him. You'll be angry at the boss. Until such time that that reality emerges, we'll just sit here waiting for God while God waits for us. Amen. <laughs>